Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is the uh, inaugural lecture of our uh, uh, half-baked colloquia series that is organized by Culinary Mind. So just two words about Culinary Mind, which is a center for philosophy of food that is based at the University of Milan and uh, aims to connect uh, food scholars all over the world. Today, we have a few of them also from the uh, US uh, now connected. Uh, and so the, the half pay colloquia series that we start today um, is, uh, is really taught as, uh, uh, you know, promoting original conversation between young scholars that work on food from different philosophical perspectives. Um, and the first speaker that we have in this series is uh, Megan Dean, who's uh, currently assistant professor of philosophy at Michigan uh, State University. Uh, Megan works in feminist philosophy, bioethics, uh, science and values, and uh, uh, it, in a good part of her research focuses on food ethics. Um, so today she's going to speak about, this is the title of her talk, Big uh, Fat Liars, Sneaky Dieters, and Factitious Allergies on Distrust and Eating. We will hear her talk, which we are going to record. Then uh, we will end the recording after this, and we'll take a short break and uh, just a few minutes, you know, four five minutes, and then we'll come back for uh, uh, Q&A after that. Okay, so Megan, I'll leave you the floor. And thank okay. you for uh, accepting our invitation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. This is great. I'm very happy to be here trying to share my screen. Okay, looking. Okay, yeah. So hi everyone, thanks for being here today. Um, and thanks to Culinary Mind and Andrea and Nicola and Beatrice for all your work on this series, which I am so excited to kick off today. Um, so today I'm going to discuss a work in progress that comes out of my research on the ethical importance of eating. And um, one of the central claims in my work is that the ways that we understand and treat uh, ourselves and others as eaters is ethically significant, um, but it's been generally overlooked in the food ethics literature. Um, food ethics tends to focus on food as an object and how that object is produced, consumed, transported, and disposed of. Um, and that's all important, of course, but it's my contention that how we eat and understand that eating is very ethically important um, as well. Um, so so um, to have a full understanding of why it matters how we eat, we need an ethical analysis of eating and not just food. So one of the reasons why eating is ethically important is um, because the ways we understand people as eaters, especially as good or bad eaters, impacts how we treat them in ways that can be uh, unjust and harmful and generally make life more difficult for them. Uh, so today I'm going to analyze a particular sort of quote unquote bad eater and some of the negative effects of understanding people in that way. Uh, now, there are a lot of different and overlapping ways that um, someone could be considered a bad eater, right? You could be a bad eater in a moral sense, in a health related sense, um, even aesthetically, uh, you could be a bad eater. But the, the, the bad eaters I'm focusing on today are considered bad primarily because they're untrustworthy. So they can't be trusted in relation to their eating um, and specifically with regard to their reports about what they eat and why they eat as they do. So. Here's the plan for today. So I'm going to discuss three different figures of untrustworthy eaters. We have the big fat liars, the sneaky dieters, and people with uh, factitious allergies. And so I'll explain each of these in detail, what exactly is distrusted here and why in each of these cases. And then I'm gonna suggest that there are reasons to think that all these narratives are inaccurate or at least not broadly applicable. Um, and also that understanding people along these lines can lead to a variety of negative consequences. And I've divided these 
consequences roughly into epistemic and moral categories. And they are going to include things like forms of epistemic injustice, um, physical suffering, damage to moral agency, and damage to relationships. And in the final section, I'm just going to briefly touch on what should we do about that. Um, I'm not going to have time to get too detailed there, but I'm going to uh, raise some principles for uh, thinking that through. And one, one point that I'll raise there is that the stakes of being misled about someone's eating in many, many cases are extremely low, right? And they're easily outweighed by the negative consequences of taking this distrustful stance. Uh, and when the stakes are higher and we actually do need to know uh, what someone eats and why, um, we need to do a better job of creating a context where people feel comfortable sharing that information about their eating, where they assume that they can be, that they will be believed unless there's actually good reasons for doubting them and that they'll be safe to share that information. And then we'll um, have a little discussion about it. So that's the plan for today. Uh, and as I said, it's a work in progress. So I, I really welcome your comments and questions, um, your critiques during the discussion period and um, you can contact me by email at any time. So I'll have my email up again at the end. Okay, let's get started. So first we have the big fat liar. And I have some quotes here from a blogger um, who goes by, it's an anonymous blogger who goes by the name your fat friend. So she says, uh, being called a liar openly has become a regular feature of my life as a fat person. Any answer I offer about my body, the food I eat, the way I feel, or the regularity with which I move is answered with a dismissal. When asked if I exercise, I say yes. No, you don't. Or is it aerobic? It needs to be aerobic. It goes back. Have you tried South Beach? It's met with, you probably did it wrong. Uh, when asked if I've engaged a nutritionist or a trainer, I say yes for several years. Oh, you probably didn't stick to it long enough. It just takes little willpower. These questions about diet, exercise, worth, and will have no answers that will satisfy their askers. My words have already been betrayed by the believed brokenness of my body and the flawed character that created it. There's nothing I can say to counter the assumptions attached to my wide, soft frame. Coworkers and strangers offer up unsolicited advice for how to change the body I have always had, then chase it with judgment and dismissal, a scripted response delivered as if I had not spoken at all. So this figure of the big fat liar appears here in this blog post, but we also see this described in the experiences of other fat people, as well as in literature cataloging uh, prejudices in healthcare providers about fat people. And here I'm using the word fat in a neutral sense. So um, just as your fat friend uses it, it's just a description of body size. So in this case, um, what is untrustworthy about the big fat liar is the, rep the eater's reports of what they eat, right? How much they eat, uh, when or for how long a particular way of eating uh, was followed. And more specifically, there's a lack of trust about fat people reports about being on a diet or eat healthily or eating what might be considered like a normal amount of food. Um, so the content of what's said matters to whether or not it gets doubted. And why is there this doubt? Uh, as folks like Alison Reihold and Julie Guthman suggest, there's a stubborn widespread assumption that fat people are fat because of how they eat. And then people are thin because of how they eat, right? It's sort of this immovable assumption even though there's good empirical evidence that it's way more complicated than that. There's not a linear relationship there. Um, size is a product of a complex equation involving genetics, environment, metabolism, um, maybe even exposure to various toxins and so on. So, but we have this assumption and it informs our everyday understandings and perceptions as well as medical research um, and medical practice. And so when fat people report that they eat in a way that doesn't line up with that, um, with how people assume they must eat because of their body size. What gets doubted is the report, right? And what sticks is this assumption that that fat people must be fat because of how they eat. Uh, now, importantly, this, this report is, uh, is framed as a lie, right? Um, why would the fat 
person lie about how, well, it's not socially acceptable to be fat, right? And be okay with it. Uh, fat people are expected to do everything they can to get thinner. Um, so the suggestion is that fat people must be lying about uh, what they eat in order to cover up their failure to do what's expected of them. Um, or more specifically, a failure to eat healthily, right? Um, which is often attributed to a lack of self-control and willpower. Um, your fat friend also suggests the possibility that others might think a fat person is incompetent in some way. So maybe they think they did the South Beach diet, but they didn't really do it correctly. Um, so in that case, it wouldn't exactly be a lie, but it, um, it wouldn't be trustworthy either way. So that's the, the big fat liar. Now the sneaky dieter. So this figure appears in uh, nutritional and dietetics research about teen girls and young women vegetarians. And here are a few excerpts from some of that work. Uh, while appreciating that there are a whole host of moral, political, social, and health reasons for choosing a vegetarian diet, we have to admit that vegetarianism does provide the perfect alibi for dietary restriction and might therefore be a logical starting point for individuals who wish to seriously limit their food intake. In another study, um, practitioners might also want to be mindful that vegetarianism is more likely adopted by individuals with pre-existing disordered eating attitudes and behaviors, uh, rather than being the cause of such a pathology. When an adolescent begins a vegetarian diet or expresses interest in making this dietary choice, a close examination of his or her general eating attitudes and behaviors might shed light on whether concern is warranted. And though individuals may endorse motivations for vegetarianism unrelated to disordered eating, this behavior may still functionally be related to eating pathology. Regardless of endorsed motivations, vegetarianism may be an important marker for disordered eating or for the later development of disordered eating. Okay, so in this case, what is distrusted? Um, here we're distrusting eaters' reports of why certain foods, namely meat, um, dairy, food, foods that contain animal products are avoided, right? So it's not so much that you distrust that the food is avoided, right? We're not really trust, distrusting that the person actually is a vegetarian or vegan, but the reasons why they are. And why, why would we distrust that? Well, there's a suspicion that young women and girls who want to go on extreme weight loss diets, um, who are disordered eaters or have clinical eating disorders are using vegetarianism as a cover up for their food avoidance and restriction. And this is what this research, this body of research is looking into. And some of it claims to support that, that view. Um, so here the suggestion is um, first that, that the vegetarian is light, right? She doesn't want people to know that she's on this extreme diet or she has this um, disordered um, attitudes and behaviors about food, maybe because they'll, people will try to stop her or they'll worry about her or think badly of her. Um, but another possibility is that the reports about this are not trustworthy because of issues with self-knowledge. So I read some um, from some of the um, work that suggests that uh, young women might sincerely report, yes, I'm vegetarian because I care about animals, I care about the environment, but nonetheless, their diet is actually linked to disordered eating. It's actually either motivated by, um, by this uh, need to restrict in some way, um, or it's going to lead to that somehow. So uh, whatever the reporter motivation may be, there's a possibility that the vegetarianism is linked to disordered eating in some way. And so in that way, the reported motivation is just irrelevant to, to the truth of uh, the matter. Okay, and the final case is the factitious food allergy case. So here I'm, I'm talking about um, adults with food allergies, um, not kids. That's a um, whole other body of literature that I haven't got into yet, but um, this figure appears in blog posts, advice columns, um, comment sections on posts about feeding uh, guests who have dietary restrictions. Um, and there's also some empirical research that uh, gestures toward 
this character. So for example, there's a recent study that reported that 19% of US adults report um, at least one food allergy, but only 10.8% are estimated to actually have an allergy. So you have this gap uh, over 8% of people who this research suggests are lying or mistaken. So I have a few quotes here. They're kind of long, but I think they're really interesting and we'll, we'll get into them later in more detail. But um, so this is a quote from a chef in California. And he says, what happens is this, people jam up the front of the shop crew demanding all sorts of nonsense and justifying it by saying they are allergic. There's plenty of content out there that proves douchebag bloggers say it's okay to lie about your pretend dietary needs. Same theory with service dogs. So just note the, the ableism here. Um, well, well, and while this, all this is happening, everyone in the back of the house is rolling their eyes, cursing under their breath, and generally not taking the situation seriously. I get that in today's world, people are allowed to be so narcissistic and self-absorbed, they think the world evolves around them and they are entitled to warp reality in order to get their way. That's just a fact. But it's like pulling the fire alarm handle in junior high all the time. At some point, everyone is just gonna stop paying attention. And here's a comment on a, on a blog post about, uh, the, the blog post was called the most challenging dinner guest ever and it was giving recipes for accommodating people with different food um, items. But the comment section was really fascinating. Um, here's one of the comments. If you have a food intolerance like me, as opposed to a life-threatening allergy, it's hard to remain vigilant and enforce the line. People don't take it as seriously, nor should they, of course. To me, it's still funny how someone who wouldn't punch you in the gut would happily serve you something that hurts just as much. I have the most success when I compare it to lactose intolerance. Everyone understands that, and no one has to use the words explosive diarrhea at the dinner table. And one more, one more example here. So this is from someone who wrote into an advice column. I have a very severe allergy to mushrooms. I carry an EpiPen, and I have been hospitalized multiple times because of exposure to this food. My husband politely explained this to his parents when we started dating, and I was invited to family meals. Since then, most meals we have shared at my in-laws house have had very limited options for me. Somehow they managed to find a way to add mushrooms to almost everything. My husband told them we would not take part in any family meals if they didn't promise to keep the meals allergy free. His dad said, we can't promise that. Everyone except your wife likes mushrooms and we're not changing what we eat for one person. My husband's sister even called me up angry about the fact we would not be attending a party at her parents' house yelling that I was overreacting and that mushrooms are not a poison. Okay, so what is distrusted in, the, in this case? Um, here it's reported reasons for avoiding certain foods, right? So it's closer to the vegetarian case, the sneaky dieter case in this way. But similar to the big fat liar case, there can also be distrust about what is eaten, right? So it may be doubted that somebody actually avoids dairy all the time, for instance, um, because it's assumed that they're not actually really allergic. Um, so what is behind this doubt? What's behind this distrust? Um, my impression is that there's a general perception that food allergies and intolerances have become really common lately. And so they just can't possibly all be true, like that it's a new thing, that it's a new fad. Um, there's People on blog posts talk about, um, you know, when I was a kid, nobody had food allergies. Um, so there's this, I think that um, suggests that there's this, uh, that it's a trend of some kind that can't possibly be accurate. Uh, I think there's also some disbelief in the idea that um, adults can develop allergies later in life. So some people will say things like, well, I used to drink beer with this person all the time and now they say they can't eat wheat. Like that, that's, so it can't possibly be true that they can't eat wheat. Um, and then I think in that mushroom case, maybe something behind that is that the content of the food allergy is so outlandish that it can't possibly be true. Like mu mushrooms aren't poison. Some mushrooms are poison, but, but anyway, but um, so, I think, I think that might be part of, part of what's going on there as well. And so with this figure, the suggestion is that people are lying, 
about having food allergies or intolerances, right? Um, maybe they have a mere preference, right? You don't like mushrooms. Everyone except your wife likes mushrooms. Um, but they, they're they lying to make sure that their preference gets respected. That's the story. Um, so they claim to have an allergy. Uh, I think there's also a suggestion that people are lying because they want to seem interesting. Somehow having an intolerance or a, a food allergy makes you interesting. Um, like the, the Robotropolis uh, comment that I read earlier, um, people don't really take intolerances seriously, right? Beside, uh, despite the fact that they can cause significant suffering. So maybe some people who have intolerances are lying about having allergies so that they actually get respected. Um, there's also the possibility of some issues with self-knowledge here, right? So maybe it's not entirely, maybe it's not always a lie. Um, but the blog post by the chef that I read suggests that some people may be misled by those um, douchebag bloggers who convince them that everyone is allergic to gluten or intolerant of onions or whatever it is. Um, one of the studies that I read about adult allergies suggested that a lot of people who claim to have allergies probably just have intolerances, but they don't understand the difference. Um, so there may be um, some issues with that as well. And another study suggested that a lot of food intolerances are just psychosomatic. Um, the, the, what they said was, uh, many patients believe that they are allergic or intolerant to certain foods solely on the basis of self-persuasion. So, so we have the possibility of lying here, but we also have some issues with self-knowledge that might um, make these reports untrustworthy. Okay, so, so these are our three sorts of untrustworthy eaters, and I've outlined some of the narratives about these eaters, why they are not trustworthy, um, and uh, what they can't be trusted about specifically. And I wanna be clear that I don't uh, endorse those narratives, right? I think there are actually good reasons to doubt them, if not entirely reject them or key parts of them. Um, for example, there's, uh, as I mentioned, there's good evidence that body size is not directly correlated to eating um, and that weight loss diets don't generally result in long-term weight loss. Um, also the evidence that suggests that vegetarianism is a cover-up for eating disorders, disorder eating, um, is in my opinion inconsistent. Inclusive. And I make that argument in another paper and I can talk more about it later if you're interested. Um, but I don't think that there's good evidence to support that at this point. More research needs to be done. Um, and also, uh, adult food allergy and intolerance rates are actually quite high. So um, I said before, it's about one in 10 adults that are estimated to have food allergies. And 15 to 20 percent of the population has food intolerances. And um, that 20% number was reported um, even 20 years ago. So, you know, when many of us were kids, there was still that 20% of people who had um, food intolerances. So it's not that new of a thing. So I think there are reasons to question the accuracy of the narratives and be very critical of their application um, for that reason. Uh, but today, my aim is not primarily to argue against the narratives by poking empirical holes in them. Um, I think narratives like these tend to be quite stubborn in the face of that sort of critique. And I suspect it's because they resonate with other um, powerful prejudices against fat people, uh, young women and girls and disabled or chronically ill people. Um, so my focus for the rest of the paper is instead to show that understanding people in this way can be damaging. And hopefully that motivates us to look for new narratives. Um, and just to, uh, set this up. I don't think that each narrative is damaging in exactly the same way. Um, but for the purposes of today talk, today's talk, I'm just going to highlight a few examples in each of the, um, the categories of um, epistemic and, and moral consequences, just to give us a good basis for discussion. But we can talk about the differences more um, during our Q&A. Okay. I love this picture. I found it online and I thought this mysterious French fry eater is so perfect for this talk. Um, okay, so I want to talk first about um, some epistemic um, damage or harm, conse negative consequences that come out of using these narratives to understand people. 
And I wanna talk about epistemic injustice, which is just a broad category that refers to ways that people are wrong as knowers. And specifically, I want to focus on testimonial injustice. So someone's subject to testimonial injustice when others fail to give that person's testimony an appropriate level, level of credibility on the basis of an identity prejudice, right? Some bias based on who the testifier is taken to be. Uh, this form of testimonial injustice, which if you've heard of it, you've probably heard um, from Miranda Fricker's work. Uh, so it occurs when, um, for example, a woman's credibility is unjustifiably lowered on the basis of something like a negative sexist stereotype, like all oh, women are so overly emotional. Right? And so instead of looking for information about whether a particular woman is credible on a particular topic, an audience may preemptively and unjustifiably uh, lower her credibility based on that sort of stereotype. And I think with all three of our untrustworthy eaters, uh, this sort of um, injustice could occur. All the narratives I've outlined suggest that eaters aren't credible reporters about their own eating, like whether they're lying or self-deceived in some way. Right? Um, when one of these narratives is used to calibrate someone's credibility, instead of taking them on their own merits, right, it, un it can unjustifiably lower their credibility. And I think there's evidence that this does in fact happen. Um, if you think about the blog post from the chef, for instance, right? The, the restaurant staff in the back, they never even meet the person who's claimed to have an allergy. They only see this little ticket with the order on it that says allergic to onions, right? And yet they doubt them, right? They roll their eyes. They... Which suggests this doubt has little to do with any legitimate um, credibility cues, right? And how, how could an illegitimate allergy or intolerance look different from an illegitimate one in that context? Um, okay. So that's testimonial injustice. Another sort of um, testimonial injustice that's relevant here is testimonial quieting. And this comes from Christy Dodson's work. So rather than the credibility of testimony being um, unjustly lowered, the testimony is treated as if it never even occurred, right? It's just irrelevant to knowledge. So Dodson puts it, the audience fails to identify the speaker as a knower in this case. And I think your fat friend describes this phenomenon when she says, you know, coworkers and strangers offer up unsolicited advice and then chase it with judgment and dismissal, delivered as if I had not spoken at all. So whatever she says is just irrelevant to the, the truth about her body, right? The audience believes that they already know everything they need to know about her, her eating habits, no matter what she says. So I think that's an example of testimonial quieting. I think this could also happen in some of the sneaky dieter cases, uh, specifically because of the suggestion that the reported motivations of a vegetarian are just, are possibly irrelevant to whether or not it's linked to disordered eating. Right? It doesn't really matter what the vegetarian says her diet uh, means to her, why, why she is a vegetarian. Um, she might not actually have access to whether or not her diet is really an eating disorder. Right, that's what the narrative says, that she just wouldn't know in that case. Okay, and a final sort of um, testimonial injustice here is testimonial smothering. Uh, and that also comes from Dodson's work. And here the idea is that the knower decides to keep quiet and not give a report at all, right? This is one way that knowers can negotiate these other sorts of epistemic injustice so they, they might assume, well, uh, the audience is not gonna give me an appropriate level of credibility. They're not gonna treat me as a knower. Uh, and Dodson points out too, um, they might believe that sharing this information could be risky or unsafe in some way. And in that context, then they might just decide not to say anything at all. Um, so Dodson describes this as a form of coerced silencing. And I think this would be, uh, unsurprising if it happened in the case of fat people, for instance, right? If a fat person expects, no one's going to believe me about what I say about my eating, um, speaking about this is only going to layer on another level of judgment, right? So not only like, oh, we think you're a bad eater, you're an unhealthy eater, but now we think you're lying about it, right? And you're trying to cover it up, then why would you even bother saying it? I think testimonial uh, smothering can also happen with the food allergies and intolerances. Um, so 
there's a there's interesting research on people with celiac disease, which is a food intolerance to gluten. And it's it some people with gluten with uh, celiac will eat foods that contain gluten at social functions or family dinners, um, and they say that it's to avoid embarrassment, being judged, or making waves. Um, some people report concealing their disease from others um, to avoid negative judgment. And that when they did tell others about their condition, people often disbelieved them, said they were making it up, being self-important, um, or they, the, the people wouldn't take it seriously and would serve them food that had gluten in it anyway. Right? So I think this is a, a, an example of a context where you think you're not gonna be believed and it's very risky to tell people because you might be judged, you might be um, uh, subject to accusations of lying, um, and you might be served food that has that's going to harm you anyway. Um, so it would make sense in that context to just not share, not share information about what you eat or why. Okay. So those are some examples of epistemic injustice that can result from relying on these sort of narratives about untrustworthy eaters. And I think there are some other negative epistemic consequences like loss of knowledge that might also follow. And we can talk more about that later um, if anyone's interested. But now I wanna move on to some moral consequences. Um, so from a feminist epistemology standpoint, if anybody's familiar with that, um, epistemic injustice does already have a moral component, right? It's bad for epistemic reasons, um, but um, so James Kidd and Javi Carroll um, put it this way, which I think is helpful. Since the social and epistemic practices of giving information to others and interpreting our experiences is integral to our rationality, identity, agency, and dignity, it's evident that injustice which harms our testimonial capacities will be a source of deep harm, right? So there may be some moral harms that are sort of inherent in the um, forms of epistemic injustice that's in, that I mentioned already, but there are also um, others that we follow from these narratives. And the first one is just physical suffering, right? I think you can see this, especially in the quotes I read about allergies and intolerances. There's a real risk that if people don't trust um, somebody's claims about having an allergy or intolerance, they won't take proper precautions when preparing or serving food. And so they can cause real suffering, um, long-term health consequences, and even, even death. Um, so that's a pretty serious uh, consequence. In addition, you know, serving somebody food that contains ingredients they have explicitly said they do not want to eat is a violation of bodily integrity and autonomy. Um, but relying on these narratives can also impact autonomy in other ways. So in the vegetarianism case, for example, what gets doubted are motivations for avoiding animal products. And these motivations are often moral ones, right? That like care for non-human animals, care for the environment, um, for slaughterhouse workers and so on, right? But this narrative might, the sneaky dieter narrative, right? Might mean that um, the vegetarian gets pathologized rather than acknowledged and recognized as someone with moral reasons and agency to act on those reasons, right? So this uh, misrecognition might mean that other people don't give the vegetarian support or opportunities that she needs to exercise her autonomy, or she might internalize this view about herself as, well, maybe I'm not really in control of my own eating choices. You know, maybe I am actually pathological in some way. And that can undermine her autonomy from the inside. So, so these, in these ways, it, um, the narrative can diminish some of the moral agency. Right, diminish moral agency. Um, but some of the other narratives we've discussed might not diminish agency as much as warp it. So Nabeen Malibo argues that narratives characterizing people as deviant or corrupt moral agents can damage moral agency in distinctive ways. She contends that this is the sort of narrative that often attaches itself to black women and women of color, right? So one example is the stereotype of black people as criminal. Um, Lebo argues that when a person is subject to that sort of stereotype or narrative, they can internalize the idea that they're morally bad or deviant in some way. And this can lead to pervasive feelings of guilt, even though the person has done nothing wrong, right? Never committed a crime in their life. Um, and Lebo points 
now that this sort of guilt can be very damaging to one's moral um, agency. Because unlike cases where someone's actually done something morally wrong, right? There's no way to make amends here. There's nothing to apologize for. There's nothing to atone for. So you can't really be relieved of your guilt through that process. Um, and once again, sort of you know, reclaim your, your status as a good moral agent. Um, there's also not really an effective way to publicly challenge stereotypes like this. Um, like they get applied to people who've never committed crimes, right? So continuing to not commit crimes <laughs> doesn't stop people from treating you like a, a criminal. And that just reinforces this internalization process. Now, I don't wanna suggest that the narratives about untrustworthy eaters are as pernicious as these anti-Black and other racist narratives that Lebo analyzes, but I do think that there's a similarity in structure here. Uh, in the cases we've discussed, insofar as people are framed as liars, they are framed as deviant moral agents, right? especially when the narrative suggests the eater is lying to cover up some other moral failing, like lack of self-control, uh, in the case of fat people, or in the case of allergies, like this, this self-centeredness, right, that um, results in unreasonable demands on people who are making your food. Uh, when we treat people like liars and morally bad um, people, because of those narratives, those people might internalize that, right? Even if, um, so they might, yeah, they might internalize that. Um, and then, you know, fat people might feel guilty about their eating even if they always eat in ways that they feel are healthy and appropriate or good, right? And people with food allergies may come to feel ashamed for asking for food that won't kill them or make them sick, uh, even though they're fully justified, right? And not at all self-centered about it. Um, and here too, because there's nothing to apologize for or stop doing, right? They might get caught up in this uh, pervasive guilt or shame without a way um, out. Also, I think it's really difficult to think of ways that people could sort of publicly shake off the narrative, right? So that it no longer sticks to them. Uh, I think part of that challenge is because a lot of eating is done privately and a lot of the symptoms of food allergies and intolerances are also very private. Um, just thinking about how someone with an allergy or intolerance would like, prove to someone at a restaurant that they they are not being unreasonable and they actually have this allergy. I mean, I guess you could have a doctor's note um, or just like publicly have an allergic reaction, something like that. Um, and for a fat person to somehow prove that they have eaten well for periods of time in their life, their whole lives, or that they've actually gone on lots of different weight loss diets and they didn't change their body size, you know, how, how could they do that? And how could they do that in a way that would carry with them to all these different contexts where people are um, understanding them as um, bad eaters in this way. I think, I think that's really challenging. And, I, and so I think that in these cases, we also have um, the possibility of warped moral agency in addition to diminished moral agency. Okay, so one final harm um, damage to consider here is damage to relationships. Uh, not all, but many of our conversations about food and eating are with friends, family, coworkers, romantic or sexual partners, right? Relationships that are very important to us and central to our ability to live a good life, right? And we are often eating with those people too, not just talking about food, um, but eating with them. And I think this distrust can put a lot of strain on those relationships, right? If you can't be confident that your family and friends are going to believe your reports about allergies or intolerances, for instance, right? Um, you will, may avoid social interactions with them altogether that involve food at all, right? Just refuse to eat at certain events, which can be perceived as rude or insulting to the host, and then you might not get invited back, you know? Um, also, I mean, I just, it's, it can't, it, it's not fun to hang out with people who think you're a liar, <laughs> right? Um, and who suspect you of being a liar. And it's really hard to see how open communication, intimacy, friendship, and connection can thrive in this context, um, especially when food and eating are just so central to so many relationships uh, and social gatherings. You know. Okay. Okay, so let us start to wrap things up here. 
Um, I've discussed these three cases of untrustworthy eaters and outlined some of the negative consequences that I think can follow from relying on those narratives. Uh, in a general sense, I think, um, in a general sense, this just illustrates how the ways that we think about and treat people as eaters, right, is really ethically important and warrants our critical attention. And more specifically, is the critique of those particular narratives, right? Um, I think they're not they're not good ways of thinking about about eaters. Um, so, in light of that critique, I want to talk a little bit about what we should do about this. We have these narratives at play. People understand others through these narratives. People understand themselves through these narratives, and they can lead to a lot of negative consequences. Um, so I think there's a lot to say here in this context about being a responsible epistemic agent, um, a virtuous knower, and so on. And um, maybe we can talk more about some of that during discussion. But I just want to share a few preliminary thoughts to, to set us up here. Um, one is maybe obvious but important epistemic point is that narratives that are grounded in false claims, like body size is directly correlated to eating or adult food allergies and intolerances are rare, should be rejected in favor of more accurate narratives. Um, I said before that I think the, the evidence for the sneaky dieter narrative is in, inconclusive. And um, so there I think more research needs to be done and especially research of a better quality uh, needs to be done on that before we have um, a clear picture of the relationship between vegetarianism and eating disorders. But we already have evidence that the relationship between body size and eating is very complex and that there are very high rates of food allergies and intolerances in adults, right? So we should seek out and promote counter narratives that take those things into account. Uh, second, I think we should exercise a lot more discernment about when we actually need to know about others eating, right? I think, you know, we do have a general interest in not being misled by unreliable information in any context. But in most cases, it just really doesn't matter if you have reliable information about how someone else eats or why, right? It makes, in most cases, it makes very little difference to me if I'm mistaken about what you eat or why, right? So in these cases, taking a preemptive stance of distrust is not really justified by the stakes of being wrong here, right? Especially when we have all of these negative consequences that might follow from that. In many cases, we just, we don't need to know. Um, some cases we do need to know, you know, if you're choosing a restaurant for a group of colleagues, um, you're a parent concerned with your daughter's health, uh, or you're a medical professional helping someone manage a diet related illness, it becomes more important to know, have reliable information about how someone eats and maybe about why they eat as they do. Um, but here I really wanna highlight the importance of creating a context where people feel comfortable and they are safe um, to being open about their food preferences and requirements, right? Uh, deploying these narratives about untrustworthy eaters, I think contributes to a context where it's not safe for people to be honest about their eating, right? They feel they will not be taken seriously in ways that will actually can cause physical harm to them, right? or that they'll be criticized, stigmatized, or socially excluded for what they share. And in that context, it does make sense that people might withhold information or not be totally honest. So when we do need to know what people are eating and why, we need to take care to create a context and to build relationships within which people can expect to be treated fairly and with respect and where they will be believed unless there are good reasons for doubt. And I don't think that we can do that if we continue to, to deploy these sorts of narratives. Yes, so here are some references for posterity's sake. Um, if you wanna read the comment section on one of those blog posts, the, the, they're listed here. Uh, and I am looking forward to hearing what you all think during discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> this was, um, it was excellent. And, um, one thing for the discussion, if any of you wants uh, to post also question on the chat, we could have done it also during the, you know, during the talk, but we are not, you know, we're a small group, but uh, you can also, if you prefer not to speak, you know, you can also just uh, write it down in chat 
and then uh, we have a, a Google Drive where we are going to save the questions. So thank you. This was really, you know, uh, rich and very, very interesting. We are going to, I think, end the recording. Uh,